happy month, everyone. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the planet Planetarium Specialist at Union Station. Excited to have you all back joining us uh, for a cloudy evening here in Kansas City. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoy today's show. Uh, and if you don't know this, we have been uh, <clears throat> excuse me, streaming live uh, for uh, almost four months now. Um, back since the beginning of April, uh, and you can catch uh, and rewatch all of our old live streams on our YouTube channel. We've uploaded all of our previous deep dives there, uh, as well as our star tours, and uh, we used to do Fan Fridays where we would uh, answer quest answer your questions, uh, Q&A style. Um, and if you're joining us, having watched uh, some of those previous shows, welcome back. Thanks for joining us once again. Just a reminder, these are Q&A shows, uh, so feel free to chime in in the comments just to say hi. Uh, and I'll try to say hi back. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to jump in as well. If you're asking a question about something I'm talking about in a moment, um, there's a better chance I'll answer that more quickly. But feel free to ask a general question that is unrelated, and I'll try to make it uh, and try to fit it in in uh, in uh, time before the end of the show. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, again, thanks uh, for joining us for this live stream. As a reminder, uh, we are, uh, the Planetarium and Union Station are open to the public now. Uh, so if you'd like to see one of our star tours at the Planetarium live, uh, then you can find tickets online at unionstation.org. We recommend buying tickets in advance, and we are following social distancing policies. And as a reminder, due to the mayor of Kansas City's mandate, we are requiring face coverings uh, for all of our attractions at Union Station. So just keep that in mind so you can plan ahead for your visit. But I hope to see you all under the stars of the planetarium. Uh, so uh, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Oh, and I'm getting some comments that the sound, the volume is a little low. So uh, let me see if I can't adjust that. Uh, hmm, let's see. Looks like we're at full volume, but I might be able to edit things a little bit. So uh, thanks for commenting. Uh, if there is an issue uh, with uh, the volume, uh, but let's see if hmm, let's see if I can I just adjust the microphone a little bit so it's a little closer to my face and I'll try to project a little bit more. But uh, just let us know uh, if there are more sound issues, but I'll try to keep an eye on that. All right, so we're, we're going to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. We had a couple questions. Uh, Tammy's chiming in, uh, one of our regular watchers. Thanks for watching, Tammy. Um, and uh, uh, Tammy is asking a question about uh, black holes. Uh, and uh, to answer this question, I would love to direct uh, Tammy as well as any of our watchers to check out our previous live stream. Uh, we did a live stream about stellar evolution, all about the lifespans of stars. Uh, and we talked a little bit of black, about black holes there. Um, but uh, just to uh, kind of spoil it for you, black holes uh, do not live forever. They actually will slowly evaporate. And this is a recent discovery um, back uh, actually pretty recently in uh, the late 90s, I believe. Uh, and uh, I believe it was Stephen Hawking that helped to make some of these discoveries about black holes that we found out that they do not last forever, that they will slowly evaporate over billions or trillions of years. Um, now, last week's stream was all about movies uh, and movie astronomy, and we covered a bunch of fun movie uh, movies like Independence Day and Armageddon, uh, as well as Interstellar, recent, uh, recent popular movie. Um, Tammy's asking though about The Martian, which is a movie we did not cover uh, during that stream. And Tammy says, uh, in the movie The Martian, Matt Damon's character grew potatoes and other foods. He also walked around in a suit quite often, plus uh, drove from one side of Mars to the other far side. I realize it's just a movie, but at the same time, I've wondered if any of these uh, things would be possible. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen the movie. I can't remember if he drove all the way to the other side of Mars. Mars is considerably smaller than the Earth, but it is still pretty large, about uh, half the diameter uh, of the Earth. Uh, and I don't think he drove all the way to the other side. He probably drove a bit of a distance to get maybe to one of the other landing sites. Um, but, you know, uh, with uh, when planning a trip to Mars or uh, starting a colony there or just even living there for a prolonged period of time, we do want to... Uh, bring food with us but we want and more importantly we want to bring the ability to grow more food because we can't bring you know enough potatoes for uh, an entire year on mars we sh it would be a lot smarter to bring uh, the materials to grow more potatoes and have a renewable food source like that so uh, that uh, is definitely uh, based in reality 
All right, so remember, uh, feel free to comment just to say hi, or if you have any questions, jump in and I'll try to keep an eye on them. Uh, I wanna start out though, uh, so today's topic is gonna be about the Southern Hemisphere stars. Uh, so all the stars hiding below the equator that are gonna probably be pretty unfamiliar to a lot of us up here in the north. Um, but since this is kind of a star tour, we're gonna uh, do a little bit of a throwback during our uh, uh, old streams when we did star tours on Mondays, uh, every Monday. I would talk about some space news, so I'm gonna jump over here to talk about a very exciting thing that's happening this week, and that is the launch of the Mars Perseverance rover. Uh, this is the, um, uh, this uh, will be a rover that hopefully will be launching to Mars uh, this uh, Thursday at 6.50 a.m. Central Time. Uh, and uh, if this uh, rover looks familiar to you, uh, that is probably because it is the big brother of the Curiosity rover. Uh, so the Curiosity rover was the last Mars rover that NASA sent back in 2012, so it's been a little while. Uh, and this rover is based on a similar platform, um, and uh, it shares a lot of similar characteristics, uh, pretty much the exact same uh, layout, but uh, some new and more modern instruments on it. Uh, so that launch should be happening early Thursday morning. We'll definitely post about that on our Facebook page uh, in case anybody is still sleeping during that time. But uh, fingers crossed that that launch date goes well. Um, with Mars, uh, our launch windows are pretty small, or well, uh, not necessarily small, but only come every two years or so. So if we miss this year's launch window, which I think goes through August, uh, then we might have to wait a very long time to launch uh, Perseverance. So fingers crossed the weather's nice uh, this Thursday, so be sure to check that out. I also wanted to mention um, that uh, this has been in the news, and we've talked about it on our live streams. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we made our own comet in my living room, so be sure to check out that live stream if you want to see that uh, really fun activity. Um, but you've probably heard about the comet Neowise, and this is a comet that has been visible to the naked eye for about a month. Um, it had been visible in the early morning sky, uh, but then a couple weeks ago it passed around the sun, and now ever since then it's been visible in the early evening sky. This is kind of a cool chart showing us the path of Comet Neowise. It has been kind of skirting below Ursa Major. This is the legs of the big bear right here. Um, but then as you can see, it's uh, going behind there. And uh, on July 22nd, uh, which was actually my birthday, happy birthday to me, uh, was its closest approach to the Earth. So this is when it would have been closest to the Earth, not necessarily brightest, but, um, and uh, it is starting to move away from the Earth and the sun. Uh, so it will get dimmer and harder to spot with the naked eye. I'm not sure exactly when will be the last chance you'll see it with the naked eye, but if you haven't checked the check out the comet Neowise, you'll definitely want to check it out. Uh, right now, it's going to be just right behind the legs of Ursa Major, the Big Bear, which is part of the uh, contains the stars of the Big Dipper. You're going to have to get pretty far away from the city lights. Um, I would recommend uh, driving at least about 45 minutes to the west. Um, you'll want to go to the west because uh, this comet uh, will be setting in the west. Um, and if you go to the east, then when you're looking towards the west, you'll see light pollution from downtown Kansas City. So go to the west, so when you look towards the west, you don't see light pollution from the city. Um, so I would for sure recommend checking that out. Again, it is visible with the naked eye. Uh, should be cool. Uh, let's see. Um, got a comment from Emily uh, saying that uh, she loves the background. If you're referring to this background right here, uh, I like this background too, and uh, I actually... Uh, put this together myself um, and uh, let's see I uh, actually uh, meant to share this uh, if anybody wanted to download this background for themselves uh, and I'm going to share this uh, with our ooh, that's a very complicated uh, <laughs> let's see let's try to get that again um, all right, uh, yes, yeah, so I meant to uh, share this with you guys in case you wanted to see it, um, but uh, here is the link to that if you wanted to download these uh, spacey rainbow backgrounds for yourself. Um, all right, so uh, let's go ahead and jump in to our main topic for today which is the southern sky. Now, um, I wanted to start by just uh, talking a little bit about uh, the sky in general and how the stars are laid out. And we've covered this on some of our previous live streams, um, but I'm gonna use my uh, visual aid here, which is uh, this really cool uh, 
sort of globe thing. It's called an armillary sphere, but it's basically just a star globe. Uh, and uh, let's see, what can I do? Let's see. Uh, oh, I thought I was. I could turn the green screen off for a second. Oh, whoop. No, no, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll just stick with that. That's fine. All right, so uh, this is an armillary sphere, and basically what this has is a globe on the inside, uh, and then a celestial sphere. Ooh, sorry, that was probably loud. A celestial sphere on the outside. Uh, and now this is just a helpful tool to, for understanding how these stars are laid out and how they appear to us here on Earth. Uh, stars are not in a sphere, um, so some stars are further away than others. Uh, so this is not an accurate representation of the stars, but in terms of mapping them out and uh, identifying different star patterns, this is really useful. I believe this one even glows in the dark. Very cool. Uh, so now the stars are laid out and mapped out uh, relatively similarly to how we map things on the Earth. So on the Earth we have longitude and latitude. Um, and in space, we have uh, two measurements called right ascension and declination. Uh, but right ascension is basically longitude and declination is essentially latitude. Now, um, let's see. So we are in the Northern Hemisphere here in Kansas City. We're at about 40 degrees north latitude, okay? Um, so from the equator, uh, going up 40 degrees, uh, about halfway between the equator and the North Pole, that is where uh, we are located. That's where most of North America is. And it's a lot of glare, uh, but hopefully, there we go, we can see North America right there. So in North America, we can see uh, a large amount of the celestial sphere. If we were standing sort of on the edge, if I look at, if we, I, I orient this sort of edge on, um, then we can imagine that we could see, you know, a, a large sort of hemisphere of the sky, but as the Earth rotates around, um, our view of the stars will change and we'll be able to see more of the night sky. Um, so as uh, our, there we go, as the Earth rotates and us along with it, then we will see more and more stars. Now, here in North America, oh, I lost my orientation, there we go. Here in North America, um, we can see a lot of the Northern Hemisphere of stars, but we can also see some of the Southern Hemisphere of stars. Um, so I wanna go back over to Stellarium, uh, which is our free software we've been using for our uh, star tours, our virtual star tours. Of course, this is our uh, daytime sky, um, but we want to get a view of the nighttime sky. So we're gonna go ahead and fast forward time here. Get that sun to set over in the west. This is our Kansas City horizon. There we go. All right, so here is our local night sky. So now here's the North Pole. Now the North Pole is uh, directly above the, sorry, the North, the North Star rather, is directly above the North Pole. So if you shine a light straight up into the sky at the North Pole, it points right at Polaris, the North Star, and there's even a pole actually sticking out of our armillary sphere here. So that uh, hopefully gives you a perspective on how the stars are oriented. Now I can turn on a uh, grid here called the equatorial grid. And this basically just takes the longitude and latitude of the Earth, kind of extends it out into space. Um, so we can see basically this layout on the stars. A couple interesting things here. I want to point out that Polaris, while it is the called the North Star, it is not perfectly north. It's actually a slightly offset from true north. There is no star here visible to the naked eye that is uh, a North Star. So we just use Polaris for navigation there. Um, but as you can see here, uh, the equator is represented by this line, but we can see many stars that are visible below the equator. Of course, uh, with the Liberty Memorial here, we can't see many of them, but um, we can we can uh, hide that. Uh, let's just go ahead and give ourselves sort of a foresty, or I'm sorry, a, sort of a nice flowery field background there. Um, Oh, Melissa is saying, thanks, glad you, oh, absolutely, eh, no problem. Thanks for sharing the background. Uh, Asana is asking, where can I find an armillary sphere like that? Uh, this one I got on Amazon. They're pretty expensive though, uh, so just keep that in mind, but they're very cool. Uh, and Jenna is saying that they haven't uh, had any luck uh, to see the comet, I'm assuming, with the naked eye. Clouds haven't helped, so that is very true. They are certainly not very helpful when it comes to stargazing. 
Um, all right, so a back end stellar aim here. As I was mentioning, so this is this line right here represents the equator of the stars, so to speak. So everything below this line is in the southern sky. But as you can see here, if I fast forward time, while the stars do some change a little bit, there is a little bit of the southern sky that we cannot see here in North America. Um, so there are some constellations that are unfamiliar to us, but there are some very uh, famous star patterns that are southern star patterns, uh, such as Sagittarius here, represented by the teapot. That's a very prominent feature of our summer skies towards the south. Um, and as you can see here, we've got uh, the planets Saturn and Jupiter are also right now visible in the southern hemisphere. Um, so we can actually see a lot of the night sky from uh, here in uh, Kansas City. In fact, uh, I did the math and we can see uh, just about 82% uh, of uh, the celestial sphere. Um, but there's a lot of it that's unfamiliar to us and there's a lot that is just not visible very often. Now here, uh, towards the north, there is a region of the night sky that is always visible. It's called the circumpolar region. Basically, any, anything inside this circle here uh, will always stay up all night um, because, you know, if I fast forward time here, we can see the Earth ro rotating, which rotates our view of the sky. And some of these stars, like the stars of the Big Dipper, will never actually set. We'll see them all night long. Uh, Eric is asking, if, or is mentioning, that Polaris has not always been, uh, or will not always be, the North Star, right? Uh, and uh, mentioning this is due to the wobble in Earth's rotation, and that is true. This is due to precession, um, and I talk about that a little more in depth uh, during um, a few previous live streams. Uh, one live stream that I talked about that was our Fantastical Universes of Fiction live stream, where I talked about um, how the planet of Westeros, or the, the planet that Westeros is on in the Game of Thrones universe, uh, could actually have stra strange seasons because of uh, a processional interaction uh, in that fictional solar system. Uh, but we actually talk about uh, the North Star and the future North Star in our live star tour at Union Station. So uh, to this question, I will say you'll definitely have to come see one of our live star tours to learn a little bit more about that. But we're going to focus on the current uh, night sky right now. So now uh, another thing I just wanted to mention is that it's pretty easy to find a uh, geographic north here in the northern hemisphere because it's easy to find the north star there. Um, let me rewind back to our earlier evening sky. Um, all you have to do is take these two stars at the end of the spoon in the Big Dipper and draw an imaginary line through them and it points right at Polaris. And Polaris is a fairly bright star. It's the 45th brightest star in the night sky, so it's fairly prominent. Um, but we are going to change things up. So we are going to flip this star tour upside down, and I'm going to move us to Wellington, New Zealand. And the reason I chose this is because um, Wellington is at about 40 degrees south latitude, which means it is pretty much opposite to the Earth. So it's going to give us sort of a similar perspective um, uh, that what we get uh, here in Kansas City, um, but it's going to give us a very, very different view of the stars. And they even prepared us a special horizon. So here is our horizon uh, in Wellington. This is at the, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I thought I wrote this down. I believe this is the, the Victoria Point. This is a just a little, uh, little lookout place here uh, in uh, Wellington, New Zealand to kind of see the horizon. So give us a nice little uh, different perspective on our sky here. Now, uh, right now, New Zealand is on the other side of the Earth, uh, and because of its uh, longitude, it is in a different time zone, so it's actually uh, already in tomorrow. It's time traveled a little bit. It's just in a different time of the day right now. Um, so what I'm going to do here is we are going to just fast forward and we'll look at tomorrow's evening sky. Now, I actually, I'm going to rewind a little bit because, so let's look at noon right now in New Zealand in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the sun looks pretty low in the sky compared to what we see in the northern hemisphere right now. In the summertime, in the northern hemisphere, the sun is very high in the sky, and that's why it's warm in the summertime, because the sun's light reaches us more directly. In the southern hemisphere, though, it's winter, because the sun's light is reaching them less directly because of the angle. So uh, this is something a lot of people learn in grade school, but again, um, uh, this is, you know, it's seeing this for ourselves is kind of helpful to understanding the interaction between the position of the Earth and where you are on Earth and the position of things in space. So it is winter down in the Southern Hemisphere now because of uh, air and water currents, they may experience different weather. So it might not be snowing in New Zealand right now, but the point stands that it is technically the season of winter down there. 
So the sun is going to be low in the sky at noon. And we're going to go and fast forward to sunset. I do want to have a disclaimer. This These cardinal directions may be slightly off. So I don't want to hear anybody complaining about it in the comments. Um, so let's go and fast forward time. Sunset's pretty early in New Zealand tonight. Uh, or tomorrow, I should say, because it is winter there. So it's about 7 p.m. and the stars are already out. And this is the southern night sky. Now, there are going to be a lot of differences and a few similarities we will see here. Now, first of all, when we look towards the north, uh, well, we first of all, we see the moon. Um, so you can see the moon from anywhere on Earth, uh, for sure. And there might be some familiar star patterns that we see. For example, I can see Scorpius up here, this bright red star, Arc, uh, sorry, Antares, um, with four stars fanning out next to it. Uh, that is the Scorpion constellation, its claws and then its tail curving here. But it appears kind of upside down. And right now, uh, whenever it appears in our night sky here in the northern hemisphere, uh, it is uh, right below or right next to the horizon. So it's really low in the sky towards the south. But as you can see here, we can see it high in the sky towards the north. So Scorpius is way up here near the zenith, the highest part of the sky. So that is a very, very different view. Uh, we still have the planets Jupiter and Saturn, but their positions are reversed here. Um, and many other constellations will appear in a very interesting orientation. So I'm just going to cut to the chase and we're going to turn on our star patterns here. Now there are a couple other star patterns we can see, like Hercules right now. For us, is at the zenith, the highest part of the sky. But as you can see here, it's low in the horizon. We've got the constellation Buotis with Arcturus, which is our brightest star in the night sky right now. Um, but it looks upside down. We have Virgo backwards from what we're used to seeing. And right now, um, the head of Leo the Lion is visible for us, uh, but, uh, or sorry, rather, Leo is just backwards. Its head is hiding, just like it is here uh, in New Zealand. We can turn the pictures on here. Um, so a lot of different uh, orientations. Just, uh, mostly people uh, who recognize constellations and travel to the Southern Hemisphere, they just uh, point out that constellations appear upside down to them, essentially. Um, Orion, most notably, appears very, very weird and upside down. Now, uh, let's go ahead and look towards the south here. And we can put our equatorial grid on, and we can find uh, where the southern celestial pole is. But the weird thing is that there is no south star. So there is no bright star near the southern pole. Now there is a star over here um, called uh, Sigma Octanus, which is part of the Octans constellation. Uh, but this star is about a five and a half magnitude, which um, basically the magnitude of a star tells you how bright it is. And the dimmest star that you can see with the naked eye is a magnitude of six. So 5.5 is like barely visible um, to the naked eye. And depending on atmospheric conditions or light pollution, you might not even be able to find it. So uh, that star was not a reliable tool for uh, celestial navigation. So how do people in the southern hemisphere find south without a south star? Uh, well, there are a couple different ways. So um, the most common way is using uh, the constellation the Southern Cross. So we look up here high in the southern sky. We can find four bright stars that form a very, very, very distinct cross here in the sky. Uh, and yeah, there it is. So if we draw an imaginary line through the cross straight down into the sky. Uh, it crosses through the southern celestial pole. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. We need a way to triangulate this. So next to it are two bright pointer stars that are part of the constellation Centaurus, the centaur. And if we draw a perpendicular line from these stars down into the sky, it'll cross through the other line. And that will show us roughly where the south pole is. So it's going to be right around here. So a little bit more complicated than just finding the south uh, or just then finding Polaris, the North Star, since there is no South Star. Um, there are a couple other ways you can find it. Uh, there is, uh, so a couple bright stars uh, are nearby. Uh, there is uh, the star Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the sky, uh, second only to Sirius, which is a star we can see. Uh, Canopus is at the end of the Carina constellation. I believe this is it. Yep. I um, mean, basically, uh, if you uh, take this star uh, and then uh, let's see and then another star right here at, at Kanar, at, at Kanar um, and we make a 
sort of equilateral triangle with these two stars, where the third imaginary point would be of this triangle is roughly south. Um, and then we can also use these two sort of uh, cloudy objects here, which are the Magellanic clouds, to triangulate south as well. So make a triangle between these objects. And we'll talk about these in a minute. Um, so there are a couple different ways you can find south. Uh, it's just a little bit more uh, complicated than we are used to here in the north. Now uh, let's take a quick water break and uh, check into the comments. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for the, the compliment. I appreciate you enjoying my teaching. Uh, let's see. Asna is uh, mentioning uh, how much they miss uh, the background music from the planetarium. Uh, and it is very calming. <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to have you back when it's uh, when you feel comfortable as well. And I do have the background music from the planetarium playing right now. And you might not be able to hear it. I can turn it up a tiny bit. So hopefully that is somewhat calming for you as well. Uh, Deanna, I'm glad you love this place as well. And uh, Cindy uh, saying, neat tip for finding polar south. Well, there you go. Next time you travel south of the equator. And remember, you cannot find Polaris. You can't see it uh, south of the equator because you'd have to look through the Earth to be able to see it. So you'll need some way of navigating. Got a couple questions. Um, Christy's saying, are there better directions to look when stargazing at night? Uh, I would just recommend thinking about light pollution. So if you're planning on traveling away from Kansas City, for example, just keep in mind that um, whatever direction you travel in, in the opposite direction, there will be a lot of light pollution because of the city lights, unless you get really, really far away. Jennifer asks, uh, does a waxing moon illuminate on the right side uh, in the Southern Hemisphere or is it flipped? Ooh, that is a really great point and a great question. Uh, and that is definitely worth talking about. Uh, so the moon will appear flipped. And that's another thing. Uh, some people know the moon's phases and whether it's waxing or waning based on what side of the moon is illuminated. And in the southern hemisphere, the moon will appear sort of upside down, so to speak. So that is backwards. So that's a really good point, Jennifer. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, Eric is saying, with the different orientation, are there different constellations identified only in the southern hemisphere? And yes, there are for sure. And we'll talk about them in a minute. Of course, I'm <laughs> going very long-winded. I have a very short, I just wanted to let everybody know, I have a very short outline, and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a nice short uh, stream that'll be over in 30 minutes, but I think we've all learned at this point that that's not the case. Um, so I'll try to be more succinct, guys, but I appreciate you tuning in and appreciate you chiming in and asking questions as well. Uh, Jennifer is saying, when setting up a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, would you have to go through that process to find the South Pole, or can you align the telescope with a brighter object? Ooh, that's a really good question. So um, when I did my live stream where we learned how to set up a telescope, uh, which remember, you can rewatch that if you want at, on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, but when we, uh, uh, when we did that live stream, I mentioned that you use Polaris to uh, do polar alignment of telescopes here in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, if you had a manual telescope that required that manual alignment down in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, well, then you would not be able to use the North Star. Um, I'm assuming that uh, manufacturers of telescopes offer uh, a sort of a southern hemisphere version of the polar alignment system that will have uh, various stars that you can use to align. And um, through the telescope and through that uh, alignment scope, you'll probably be able to see uh, dimmer stars like Sigma Octanus. Um, and so maybe you can use that to do polar alignment for your southern hemisphere telescope. But that's a really good question, Jennifer, that I don't know the answer to. And those are my favorite kinds of questions because I can learn something new. Um, all right. Let me just make sure we're all caught up. Cool. All right. Awesome. Uh, so one quick thing I wanted to mention. Uh, this is kind of cool. Uh, the flag of Brazil is uh, actually contains a lot of the stars uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it includes the Southern Cross right here, uh, as well as it actually uh, includes um, the, uh, the South Star, uh, Sigma Octanus, which is also nicknamed Polaris Australis, which just means South star, south pole star essentially. Um, and uh, these stars actually, uh, kind of a fun fact for you, uh, these stars uh, represent the night sky above Rio de Janeiro at 6 or 8.30 a.m. on November 15th, 1889, uh, which is was the moment that Brazil officially became a republic. Uh, it's known as Republic Day uh, down in Brazil. And each of these 27 stars represent the 27 Brazilian states, uh, as well as the federal district. Um, and each of them correspond uh, and then this star up here is actually Spica, which is a famous uh, visible star here in the Northern Hemisphere. And it represents uh, the state of Para, uh, which uh, is the only Brazilian state, or was the only Brazilian state in the Northern Hemisphere at that time. There are a couple others now, but 
Kind of cool that uh, the Brazilian flag uh, actually it references stars in the southern hemisphere. Um, there are a couple of deep space objects I wanted to mention really quickly. Um, and we are going to talk about constellations too, don't worry. Uh, but I wanted to point out the small and large Magellanic clouds. And these are really awesome. Uh, and these are only visible if you get below the equator. Uh, and these here are actually galaxies that are close to our Milky Way. They are some of the closest galaxies uh, to the Milky Way. They're only about between 160 and 200,000 light years away from us, uh, which is pretty close in, this, in the scale of entire galaxies. Um, but let's go over to Space Engine here, which is our uh, 3D space software. Uh, and here we can zoom out and out and out and out and out and out and out all the way out to see our entire Milky Way galaxy, which for some reason is very dim. Let's increase our exposure here so we can see it. Um, and then we can see the Magellanic clouds there close by. So these are two galaxies that are very close uh, to the Milky Way. And uh, here they are. There we can see them there. Now, uh, these are irregular dwarf galaxies. Um, and it used to be believed that they were orbiting the Milky Way. But actually, there's some recent evidence that suggests that they're only passing by us or may even be on a collision course to us, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we think they used to be barred spiral galaxies, which are similar to the Milky Way. Um, but since they've gotten close to the Milky Way, their structures have been disrupted by uh, gravitational tidal forces. Uh, the large Magellanic Cloud here is about one-tenth the mass of the Milky Way, um, and it's a lot more gas-rich than the Milky Way, uh, so it has more gas than uh, stars, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, the large Magellanic Cloud hosted a supernova back in 1987, which uh, was the brightest supernova observed over the past four centuries. Uh, let's go back over here. Now there's a really awesome nebula visible, uh, so we can see the outline of the Milky Way stretching up here. Uh, the northern, or the sorry, the Southern Cross is inside of it, and near the Southern Cross is a really cool nebula. Now we've got the Orion Nebula in the Northern Hemisphere, although you can see it in the Southern Hemisphere too. Um, but this is the Carina Nebula, which is about four times as big and bright uh, as the Milky, or sorry, as the Orion Nebula. So a uh, very very cool. Uh, and here is. So we can zoom in here uh, in Stellarium to see uh, the Carina, Carina Nebula. But the Carina Nebula contains a lot of other famous uh, features uh, and uh, famous uh, and popular spots for deep space photography. Um, so uh, it's one of the coolest nebulas and uh, one visible to uh, the naked eye and through a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you have access to a telescope down there, definitely check that out. Uh, Jim is saying, oh, wow, amazing. I know, right? Space is so cool. Uh, Jennifer, this is great. Uh, now I want to travel to see a different night sky. I know, it's so cool. Um, I was really lucky to get to go uh, to the uh, Southern Hemisphere a couple years ago and see all these things for myself. I mean, it's definitely a trip that if you ever have a chance to, uh, it's worth taking for sure. Uh, and Asna is mentioning that uh, they can hear the background music. Awesome. <laughs> Glad you uh, can hear it. Hopefully it's a little bit relaxing for you. Um, all right, so uh, one other deep space thing I wanted to mention is uh, this star up here, which is Alpha Centauri. Now, Alpha Centauri is not just one star. It's actually a multiple star system. Uh, there are three stars in this system, two binary stars with one more distantly orbiting it. But if Alpha Centauri seems familiar to some of you, that's because it's a very famous star. And this is the closest star system to our solar system. Um, so... Let's uh, go find it. We're gonna have to fly back in the Milky Way here. Whoa! Uh, oop, and this is not Alpha Centauri. This is A Centauri. Very confusing. Oop! <laughs> I was gonna be pressing the wrong button. Uh, let's see. How do I type an alpha character on my keyboard? Um, well, uh, so Alpha Centauri uh, is a binary system, and then it has a third star called Proxima Centauri orbiting it, and that's really the star I wanted to show us, because Proxima Centauri is officially the closest star uh, to our sun. It's only 4.3-ish uh, light years away uh, from our sun, which is very, very close in the span of uh, universal distances. Um, let's set our exposure back to normal. 
Uh, so Alpha Centauri, that system, is actually the third brightest star in the night sky, but it is, remember, two stars very close together orbiting one another. And then Proxima Centauri is a third star orbiting kind of farther away from them. Um, but uh, this star, actually, thanks to a recent discovery, has two known planets orbiting it, including one, this one here, uh, Pro uh, Proxima B, uh, which is the uh, closest star to it that's known, but it is... Uh, in the Goldilocks zone, so to speak, uh, in the habitable zone of this star system. And in our simulation here in Space Engine, this software, um, it uh, is simulating, it's sort of imagining uh, that this planet has uh, an ocean surface covering it. Um, so that's pretty cool that that simulation is here. Again, that is theoretical, but we do know this planet exists within the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri, that star that we can see uh, that star system we can see in the southern hemisphere and that's part of the pointer stars there that helps us find the southern celestial sphere all right so um oop, eric is saying do they have a great view of the comet in the southern hemisphere bad news they do not because right now remember the comet is crossing right below the legs of ursa major and ursa major uh depending on where you are uh, now you might be able to see part of it I'm just checking my armillary sphere here because that's the easiest way to check. Um, but yeah, so Ursa Major uh, is kind of located between 45 and 60 degrees north, if we're kind of thinking uh, latitude, um, which means that uh, if you were at the equator, you'd, you'd be able to see it. And if you were uh, in the southern hemisphere somewhere, you might be able to catch it, but it'd be very, very low on the horizon. Um, so... I'm not sure that people in the Southern Hemisphere have a great view of it right now, and there may be some places, if you're too far south, you might not be able to see it. Um, although a lot of the uh, land mass in the Southern Hemisphere is closer to the equator than the land mass in the Northern Hemisphere, um, so chances are, I guess, a lot of people probably would uh, be able to catch it. And uh, we could actually try to find it for ourselves if I just fast forward time here through a whole evening. Uh, oop, there you go. There's Orion, by the way, rising a little bit later in the night. Um, but we might just be able to catch sort of the legs of the Big Bear. Uh, is, nope, that's not it, actually. I guess we might not be able to see it down here in New Zealand. Um, but uh, that is a good question, uh, and it's definitely going to be harder to see. The, this comet is very prominent here in the Northern Hemisphere right now. So the last thing I wanted to bring up are constellations. So there are 88 total constellations, and these were officially des designated and published back in 1930 by the International Astronomical Union. Um, but interestingly, only 36 of the official constellations lie predominantly in the Northern sky. The other 52, the majority of the constellations, are in the Southern Hemisphere. So there are quite a few constellations down here, and there's some interesting stories to go along with them. Now, uh, a large number of the accepted constellations, uh, over 40 of them, are from Greek mythology uh, and were described by Ptolemy, who was uh, a uh, philosopher and writer way back then. Um, and uh, many of the constellations here in the Southern Hemisphere are uh, from Greek mythology, constellations we're familiar with, like Virgo and Hercules and Ophiuchus, Scorpius, uh, constellations like that Aquila, part of the uh, Summer Triangle, Aquarius as well. Um, but there is uh, a decent portion of the southern night sky that was not ever seen by uh, the Greeks or by the Romans or by anybody who lived uh, in Europe in that uh, area of the world. Uh, through much of the first couple millennia. Uh, now, back in the 16th and 17th century, there were a number of explorers that started to explore down south. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, famous explorers that uh, decided to make up their own constellations. And some of these were eventually uh, sort of uh, incorporated into our known constellations and officially uh, added back in 1930 by the International Astronomical Union. Uh, ooh, Jennifer is saying, if we looked at the night sky from Alpha Centauri, would we be able to see our solar system? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, and we can, I'm going to tangent real quick because that's a really good question. Let's go back to Space Engine here. Um, and let's, uh, you know what? So here's something kind of cool. Something kind of cool. 
that we can do a space engine, we can actually land on these planets. So let's actually land. Whoa! <laughs> oh, so here's uh, the ocean of uh, Centaur or Proxima B. Um, but let's let's fly back out into space here because I want to go to the night side. Let's uh, fly around. Actually, first I need to. So I, I can go to other planets in Space Engine, and then I can um, find Earth. And I'm just going to highlight it. So we should be able to see it up here. All right, so let's, whoop, let's find a spot to land on uh, Proxima B. And ooh, we might not be able to see it. It looks like it's up in the daytime right now but that is the sun and from this position uh i'm not sure space engine can tell us its apparent magnitude um so you know what i might uh cheat and let's uh let's let's uh see if the internet can help us do -do 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 -do. You know what we can do? We can turn uh, the constellations on, and we can actually see we're so close that most of the constellations here uh, from this uh, planet, four light years away from us, are pretty much identical. Because, well, all those other stars are farther away than uh, Proxima Centauri. So, if I had to guess, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that it looks like, just based on our simulation here, that the sun would appear quite bright uh, in the sky uh, at uh, Proxima Centauri. Um, now we can't really see Proxima Centauri, that star, very well because it's a very, very relatively dim star. Um, but the sun is so close and relatively bright that it seems like it would be visible. Um, but that's a question I might have to do some more research. I don't want to just make up an answer um, and be wrong. So maybe that's something I can do some research on and hopefully answer uh, next week uh, during our next live stream. All right, so back to our uh, southern night sky, back to constellations. So I want to talk about some of these explorers uh, who designated some of these southern hemisphere constellations. Uh, one notable person was a French astronomer named Nicolas Louis uh, du Lacaille. I believe I'm saying that correct. Nicolas Louis du Lacaille. He was a French astronomer from uh, he lived from 1713 to 1762, and he studied the sky at the Cape of Good Hope in present-day South Africa. So very far south. Um, and uh, he observed over 10,000 stars using only a half-inch refractor telescope. So that is a telescope about this wide. Um, now, to put into perspective how small that is, uh, you can go back and rewatch our live stream where we put together a telescope, and my telescope has an aperture of about six inches. So that is one twelfth of the size, and he observed 10,000 stars with that tiny, tiny telescope. Um, and he uh, designated, or he uh, described 14 star patterns that were eventually adopted into our 88 modern constellations. So quite a few uh, of these uh, southern constellations we owe to uh, uh, De La Caille, or D De La Caille. Um, One of, uh, or a few of these constellations are notable because they are, uh, they actually used to belong to one larger constellation. So there's a huge constellation uh, called the Argo Navis, uh, which represented the famous ship from mythology, the Argo, uh, which Jason and his Argonauts uh, used to navigate the world and try to find the Golden Fleece, famous story from Greek mythology. Um, and let's see if we can get that a bit higher in the sky for us. Okay, so we can see it even though the sun's coming up here. This used to be one of the biggest constellations, but uh, uh, Dulakai actually uh, suggested that they split this up into separate constellations. So they split it up into uh, three different constellations. Uh, Carina, which means the keel, which is the bottom of the boat. Vela, which is the sails. And Pupus, which is the poop deck. Uh, so those are three constellations he described. And then he went on to uh, create a, a few more constellations. Uh, and... Uh, uh, many of these other constellations he uh, named after various scientific instruments that he felt symbolized the age of enlightenment that they were living in. Um, and so uh, some of these constellations included Antilla, uh, which is Latin for pump. Well, this commemorated the air pump, which was invented by French physicist uh, Denis Papin. Uh, Kailum, which means uh, the chisel. And uh, Kirkunus, which is the mariner's compass. Fornax, which is uh, the furnace, which is 
meant to be a, a chemical furnace or a limbic. Uh, then there is mensa, which uh, means table, but it actually didn't represent a like a furniture table. It represented uh, table mountain, which uh, is uh, a there we go a prominent landmark overlooking uh, Cape Town, South Africa, where he uh, was. I don't know why it's so zoomed in, but there we can see Table Mountain, that constellation. Uh, and yep, so there is Mensa right there. Our picture actually matches there. Um, a few others, uh, Microscopium, Microscope. Uh, Norma, which uh, represents a right angle ruler or a carpenter's square. Uh, then we have Octans, which is at the South Celestial Sphere. Let's rewind a little bit back to nighttime here. Oop. Now we're back to daytime, I guess. All right, there we go. Um, so, do, do, do. yep, so there's octants that occupies the South Celestial Sphere, which is a navigational instrument, an octant. Uh, there's the Painter's Easel, Pictor. Uh, there's uh, Pixis, the navigational compass. Reticulum, which is the crosshairs of a telescope. Uh, sculptor, a sculptor's studio. Uh, and a Telescopium, which is just a telescope. Uh, so we can find a lot of these patterns up here. There's Microscopium, Telescopium. This constellation is so tiny, but I guess that kind of makes sense because the telescope uh, Dulekai was using was incredibly tiny as well. Um, now, there are a number of other constellations here that are part of Greek mythology that we don't see, like Ara, which represents the altar, or a, a sort of an, a religious altar. Um, and uh, there is another fish constellation, Pisces Austrinus, which is the southern fish, uh, another fish up there. Now, a few other Dutch explorers actually uh, uh, designated many other famous southern constellations. This is between the 16th and 17th century. This included uh, Pieter Dirksoon Kaiser, uh, Frederick de Hootman, and Petrus Plankius. I probably got none of those names right. Um, but uh, they described a lot of other constellations, many of them animals uh, based on uh, animals that they found in their travels. Uh, there are a number of constellations uh, colloquially known in a group as the Southern Birds. Uh, there's Pavo, the Peacock. Um, and I'm not pointing these out uh, because they are all around here and some of them might be hiding below the horizon and also we're running a little low on time. Um, but uh, there's the Peacock, there's a Crane, which is Grus. Uh, there's a Phoenix, Toucan, uh, Apus, which is the Bird of Paradise. There's Apus right there. Uh, and Columba, which is the Dove. So a lot of birds, just for whatever reason. Um, but a number of other animals, uh, there is uh, a unicorn, which is kind of weird, um, <laughs> but there is uh, also uh, a giraffe, which is uh, Camelopardalus, which is kind of a fun uh, constellation name to say. Uh, uh, there's even a constellation uh, called uh, Musca, which is literally just a fly. So they've got a lot of weird constellations down in the southern hemisphere. Um, Oh, there's the fly constellation right there. Uh, but a lot of them are just very tiny and very faint uh, and um, just not as prominent. And again, not a lot of stories to go along with them because they are not based on mythology. They're just based on uh, different tools or discoveries that these explorers made down when they were exploring the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it does make sense because even by 1930, you know, a lot of science was still dominated by Western culture. So um, when the International Astronomical Union got together to define those constellations, well, of course, they picked all the constellations that the Europeans invented. Um, and so, you know, of course, there are a lot of other cultures that see different star patterns down here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we actually did a couple live streams on uh, various sky cultures. Uh, we talked about sky cultures in Africa, um, uh, and we talked about some other Native American sky cultures, as well as Chinese sky cultures. So if you want to learn more about some other ways that different peoples saw the night sky besides these sort of Western views of the stars then definitely re-watch that live stream again you can find that on our youtube channel um but uh yeah so that is just a really brief tour of the southern hemisphere stars so uh, again we share uh about uh 80 or sorry about uh one one or sorry two thirds <laughs> about 60 percent of uh the night sky in here in new zealand uh is the same night sky that we can see here in kansas city it's just a little bit uh, oriented differently uh, and some of the constellations appear in a different orientation slightly upside down uh, from what we are used to here in the northern hemisphere um, but there are quite a few constellations that uh, we wouldn't be able to see those constellations basically any constellation that 
um, is circumpolar here in New Zealand. Uh, any constellation in this range are constellations that we cannot see here in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, we are running pretty late on time, so we are going to go ahead and bring ourselves to a close in this live stream. Uh, it seems like we've got no more questions right now. Uh, so that just to give us a good opportunity to wrap up. Um, so I hate to rush to the ending, but uh, this does uh, bring us to the end of our stream. We're running out of time here. So I wanted to thank you all again for joining us for another Planetarium live stream. Um, we uh, will be announcing what the plan is for next week. Uh, right now, plan on being back here at uh, on Monday at 6 p.m. Um, but uh, we will announce the topic for next week's live stream in the coming days. So just stay tuned to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page. By the way, if you are watching on a different page, head over to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page and be sure to give us a like and subscribe so you won't miss any future updates uh, and you won't miss information about the upcoming NASA launch coming on Thursday. Uh, for now, though, this will bring us to a close. Uh, I have been your Planetarium Specialist, Patrick Hess. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this stream, and we will see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.